I want to start by, by drawing our eyes to something that's, that's happened uh, recently. Um, just about a month ago, uh, after what would be a normal, um, just relatively common um, church service um, at a university in Kentucky, uh, something kind of strange happened. Maybe you guys have heard about this, but I'll take you through the storyline. Um, at Asbury University on February 8th, as the service came to an end and people began to file out to go to classrooms, some people lingered behind and just began to pray and talk about the Lord and, and kind of pray for each other and sing some more praise. And what happened next is what was surprising is normally how a service like that ends is people just kind of continually keep trickling out until there's no more left and it's over. Um, but what happened was instead of that, the opposite happened. People kept trickling back in. Some people came and came back and saw that people were doing this and joined them. And then some people finished the next class that they were at because it was actually in the morning and they heard there's still people in there worshiping and they kind of trickled back in. And, and slowly but surely throughout the day, more and more students started pouring into this, into this chapel. The interesting part is it came to be nighttime and they didn't close it down. In fact, some people left, but some others showed up and Prayer continued all the way through the night, and by the next morning, after 24 hours of this going on, people realized there was something strange happening. In fact, some people who were students on there started taking video, posting it to social media, saying this has been going on for 24 hours. Oh, you lose me? There you go. People aren't leaving. People are still coming. More people are coming. The service is, is packed out. And as they shared that on social media, all of a sudden, all the students on campus begin to come. People from other campuses, other students and other ministries began to come and join them. And all of a sudden, the, the place was absolutely packed out. Now, after that happened in day two and into day three, mainstream media caught on and it was actually shared across multiple platforms. Um, and then something crazy happened. A small town of 6,000 people saw in two weeks around 70,000 people travel to come to these church services. They literally shut down the entire town. People packed in, surrounded this. They set up overflow locations. And for two weeks, this church service went on nonstop, nonstop, where people would pray and, and, and sing and worship. What they're calling it now is the Asbury Revival. It actually just took place, like I said, last month. And when all this was going on, there's conversation in the church about, like, what does this mean? Like, is this important? Is this, what do we grasp out of this as, as Jesus followers? And a couple of things just right away. First of all, I always say, when things like this happen, just pause for a second, okay? Everyone rushes. All these, like, social media influencers or these social media Christians always rush to be like, here's what I think. I don't know what happened to our culture that everyone thinks everyone needs to know your opinion on something, right? I don't know what, we're so narcissistic. Well, here's what I think. You're like, do you know anything about it? Were you there? Do you know anyone there? Do you have any connections there? No. Well, maybe you should just shut up and thank God for, like, what's going on, right? Like, it's so weird. Everyone just rushes to be like, here's my opinion. Well, first of all, just back up from that. But the question is, like, what does this mean? And, and what in reference to the church in the broadscape would this be? When we talk about the word revival, they're calling it the Asbury Revival. That word revival is not in the Bible. And there's a lot of words that we use that are in the Bible. And what I mean is when we use a word that is in the Bible, God gets to clearly define it and we know how to use it. But the word revival is not. Revival is a man-made word to try to describe what God has done throughout history. But I think that we can misuse it, and I think we can, we can misdirect it. One of the big ways I think that people misuse this word revival is very often people will talk about revival as though it's like an event that we do, and it's not that. Or they'll talk about it as though it's like a whole bunch of people coming to know Jesus. And actually, it's not that either. What that is, is that's actually called an awakening. And those have happened multiple times throughout just recent American history. There have been moments where culture has been far away from anything related to God. And then there's this kind of strange influx of interest and draw into who God is. And those who were asleep in regards to the Lord are suddenly awakened to the spiritual reality that's around them. In fact, just in American modern history, there have been at least two great awakenings. I would argue there's a third. 
In the 1700s, when this country was being founded, when it was still just the 13 colonies, when literally the population of the 13 colonies in the United States was 340,000 people, there was an awakening. Names like John Wesley in England and Jonathan Edwards in the United States began preaching and teaching and thousands upon thousands of people turned out and were drawn in. In fact, in 1950, when the population of the United States was only 340,000 people, over the course of a handful of years, about 50,000 of that 350 ended up joining the church. Think about how crazy that is and how much it would shift the culture. We saw a second great awakening in the 1800s. This is where the United States had expanded and actually had the, the Louisiana Purchase. There were way more people spread out farther than ever as the, the United States continued to grow. And in this moment, kind of the mainline denominations, they didn't really even understand what to do in these far-reaching areas people were going into. But what sprouted out was something called Methodism. And it was actually one of the biggest uh, movements that happened at the time. In fact, one of the cool things about the Methodist culture was that instead of giving pastors a church, they gave them a horse and said, go and teach people wherever they're at. In fact, the, the guy who was really quoted as like being the guy behind the Methodist movement in the 1800s was none other than Francis Asbury. The name of that university came from him because he was so influential. In fact, under his leadership in the Methodist church, get this, in only 30 years time, the Methodist church grew from 8,000 people to 250,000 people. Isn't that insane to think about? D.L. Moody came around in the middle 1800s. And we might know him because, of course, we're close to Chicago. D.L. Moody was another person who he literally just started a Bible study in Chicago. It exploded to 1,500 people. Then he started a church out of that, which, of course, gave birth to the university that you know of in, in, up in Chicago. And there was this big movement inside of the major cities in the 1800s where a substantial number of people joined the church, where there were this movement, this influx into the church. Now, those two are just commonplace in regards to culture uh, talking about like, you know, church history. But I actually believe there was a third great awakening as well. Because after we got done with World War I and World War II, there was kind of a new cultural norm in place. In fact, it was like social Darwinism. A lot of that had kind of given rise and science was really like, that's our new religion. That's what we teach people. We're not really interested in these spiritual things. There was this kind of very like materialist concept, Ayn Rand, all these different people who wrote about this kind of new mindset. And in the middle of that, church attendance and participation dropped to the lowest it had ever dropped to before in American history. In fact, for the first time ever, it dipped below 50%. For the first time ever, the majority of people were no longer participating in a Christian uh, community. And in the midst of that, there came this, this moment of the crusades and revivals. The biggest name, of course, in that would be the one you might have heard, Billy Graham. Billy Graham came in the 40s. By 1949, he hosted a three-week crusade that turned into an eight-week crusade where 350,000 people showed up. And in fact, over the course of the 50s, he preached to millions upon millions of Americans. And he was just one of many who hosted these crusades where there was this big movement of the spirit. And we see this. This is pretty wild, okay, to think about. By 1940, they figured less than 50% of the culture was participating in Christianity. By 1960, only 20 years later, attendance was back up above 70%. That's how fast that turn was, right? In just 20 years' time, culture seemed to have this big awakening once again. Now, preceding every one of those awakenings is what I would say is a biblical definition of the word revival. Before each and every one of those awakenings, there was a revival. Revival means to be brought back to life. It means something that's dead comes back to life. And before each of these awakenings, there was a revival, not of those who were lost, but of those who knew God. You see, there's this problem in faith. There's this problem in Christianity. There's this problem in, in our interaction with Christ in that people have a tendency to grow cold even to the things of God. Even people who come close and experience God in a mighty way, the church has this tendency to just slowly become cold 
and to slowly die. What once was bold tends to become bland. What once was dynamic tends to become static. What once was passionate tends to become comfortable. And the church just slowly kind of ossifies and turns into this dead structure. But then, every single time this happens, something amazing happens. A few of God's people grow tired of tiresome religion. A small remnant of true faith grows hungry for more of God. That what is doesn't seem to be enough. I want more. Leaders stand up and begin to point forward to a greater dynamic of faith. And it sets off sparks inside of this small remnant that desires more. And then God begins to move mightily through that remnant. And revival begins to take place inside the church. Those things that were dead come back to life. The areas that became static become dynamic once again. And I wholeheartedly believe that where we are right now in the United States of America is ready for another revival. Ready for another. In fact, uh, a year and a half ago, in the fall of 2021, I taught a series called Trust the Process. And it was about how there is this cyclical process that you see the church go through, the people of God go through over and over and over again. You can go back and watch it on our YouTube channel if you want. And it's that the cycle goes of pruning remnant revival, pruning remnant revival, where the church shrinks down, a remnant always remains, gets more faithful and more excited, and then a revival comes inside of it. Our culture needs an awakening. There was a poll that was recently done where they asked to find who, people who were Christians and then actually kind of partnered that with action because people say a lot of things, right? Like people are like, yeah, I'm a Christian. You're like, yeah, do you know anything about Jesus? No, not really interested in that Jesus figure, right? You're like, well, I don't think you're really a Christian. But what they asked was people who were a Christian and participated in church more than once a month. So like they're actually doing something with their faith. Here's what they found. In the silent generation, 61% considered themselves that. In boomers, 49%. In Gen X, 46%. In millennials, 35%. And in Generation Z, 28%. Now, here's why I need you to see this. This is pretty dynamic. In 1960, when I believe this third kind of great awakening happened, 70% of culture was participating in some way with faith. In just a few more years, it will be the exact opposite. And 70% of our culture will not have to do with faith. That was only about 60, 70, 80 years time. Isn't that wild to think about? How much the culture could shift. And I think that means that the United States of America is deeply in need for another great awakening, a fourth great awakening of being called back to the things of God, of having this, this eye-opening experience. But in order for that to happen, the church has to experience revival. The church cannot be the comfortable, reserved, just good enough church. It won't happen. So then how do we have revival? Can we just stick around today after service? I mean, it, it worked for Asbury, right? Can some people just stick around and we just start praying and then all of a sudden just re revival happens? Well, no. Because revival cannot be manufactured. We cannot manufacture revival as human beings. I noticed one of the most common posts that happened after this revival people were sharing is they were kind of sharing pictures of it. And people were sharing like, notice, there's like, you know, no big name speakers, there's no lights, there's no fog, there's no great worship band. Look at revival happening. And, and I get kind of to some extent what they were saying, but at the same time I went, no, 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 you're missing it too. You see, what happens in moments like this is people always try to tend to look for the peripherals. They're like, look, none of those things were necessary revival, right? You don't need those things for revival. And I would say, absolutely, you're right. But also the absence of those things isn't what created revival either. You see, there's a tendency like, well, we're, yeah, take down those lights. Cancel that, right? We don't need, we, we want revival, so we're going to do it like that. And you go, wait a second, you're still getting distracted by the peripherals. Don't worry about the lights, don't focus the camera on what's happening on the stage. Turn instead and focus on the people because that's where revival starts. It doesn't start with the dynamics of the church service. It starts with the people inside of it. 
There is actually a prophetic vision of revival inside the Bible. Years and years and years, hundreds and thousands of years ago, okay, there was this, this situation where the people of God had grown cold. And this isn't like a picture of just revival like we might see it, but when we look at stories like this, we can see God's character and we can see patterns inside of it that we can then apply to ourselves. And in this story, okay, that the people of God had, had turned away. The same thing once again. This is literally 500 BC, same story as us today. They had seen God move mightily, right? Their people had exited uh, Egypt, had, had taken the promised land. God had given them great kings. And after all of this, people had still turned back to just their common ways of, of doing what they thought was best and not listening to the Lord, not obeying him. And because of that, God said what he was going to do is since they pushed him out of their culture, he said, okay, then you will, you will experience the results of that. In fact, God says, basically, since you've pushed my hand of blessing out of your life, since you've pushed my hand of, of favor out of your life, what's going to happen is your enemies are going to come and they're going to take over your land. Because I was the one who was protecting you. I was the one who was blessing you. And sure enough, the people of God, the Israelites, are overtaken by the Babylonians. You might have heard this name before, Nebuchadnezzar. He was the guy in charge. He took some of the key leaders, took them away to Babylonia. In fact, took 10,000 more, took them away, smashed the temple. And the goal was to destroy that culture for the Babylonian empire to take over in this moment. And the people were removed from the promise that God had given them because they had grown cold to God. But because God loves his people so much, he would send prophets. And prophets would speak the word of God to the people. And there was one that was named Ezekiel. Ezekiel experienced some miraculous, amazing things. But in Ezekiel 37, we see this picture where God gives him a supernatural vision of revival of his people. In fact, you could turn there if you have a Bible, you have a phone, Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. It'll be on the side screens as well. But he gives Ezekiel this prophetic vision that's gonna show him how he can do this revival work. It says this, the Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all among around the bones that covered the valley floor and they were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. It must have been some sort of giant battle here and there's just literally bones washed clean from the sun and the buzzards and just piles of them everywhere. Probably a pretty gross sight to be honest with you. Verse three, it says, then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Right response from Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel's like, this is way beyond me. You would know if that's possible. It says, verse four, then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will, be, you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. And suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. This is where it would get creepy, right? Right? I mean, Ezekiel was a powerful man of God, but I'm guessing still, he just kind of in faith was like, yeah, bones, listen to the Lord. And all of a sudden you start to hear them rumble, right? Then as I watched, excuse me, the bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. And then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. And then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and they stood up on their feet, a great army. And then he said to me, here's where God explains this. Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old dry bones and all hope is gone. Our nation is finished. 
Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And when this happens, O my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. It's amazing because he gives Ezekiel this vision and he says, I'll explain the vision to you. It's my people. They've grown far away from me where they are exceedingly cold. He says, in fact, they're like just dead, dry bones. And he says, they even admit it. They're like, as a nation, they're like, all hope is gone, right? We're lost. We're captives. There's no hope. And I need you to get this. This is what some faith leaders in the United States of America are basically saying. It's over, right? World's going to hell in a handbasket. It's done. Church is dying, close the doors, right? It's over. Look, at culture is just deadheading into the ground. Generation Z, 28%. The alphas after that, what is it gonna be, 10%? Who knows? But God says in this moment that he has a power that those people didn't understand. God asks, can these bones live again? And like I said, Ezekiel is smart. You alone know the answer to that, right? He says, I can't do that. And I need you to get this. When we talk about the church being cold, being dead, and needing revival, I need you to get this, okay? People like me, pastors or preachers or teachers, we can't preach the church into revival. It's not something that we can do. Like, we can't convince the church to have revival. We can't teach a good enough message to have revival. Just like Ezekiel, he's like, I can't do this. You could do this. All that we can do is exactly what Ezekiel could, which is just, just give the ask. The Lord has to do something in our hearts. The Lord has to do something in your heart if there's going to be revival. God tells Ezekiel, prophesy this. Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. And get this, okay? Okay. The bones who were dead heard what God said. And as he commanded them to come together, to be fitted back together, as he commanded them to grow strong muscles, to grow skin over them once again, revival happened inside of these bodies the moment the dry bones began to listen and obey the word of God. The moment the bones begin to listen to and obey the word of God, that's literally his call. He says, dry bones, listen and hear, obey the word of the Lord. And friends, I need you to get this. This is what we have in our hands. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people for every good work. And Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I need you to get that if the church is gonna have revival, Revival will come when we start listening and obeying the word of God. When we start digging in and wanting to know and hear the word of God, when we start trying to obey it. And listen, what I'm saying is, this isn't just like showing up to a message on Sunday morning and hearing the pastor talk for a few minutes. Or just like, oh yeah, I'll read the verse of the day on my phone before I go to bed. What I mean when revival starts is that you are going to desire to know more about the Lord. That the Bible isn't something that's like a maybe. It's like I need to today. I need to dig into God's word and I need to hear more about who he is. I want to know his truths. I want to hear his teachings and I want to understand who he is on a deep level that I have this desire to pull the Bible into my heart. And not only that, but not just listening, but obeying. 
And this is where we take the word of God and we take our own lives and we lay our own lives over top of the word of God. And then as painful as it is, we take a knife out and we cut off every part of our life that falls outside of the word of God. We do surgery on ourselves and find where our lives don't line up on top of the word of God. And in obedience, we remove those things from our life. We cut them away as painful as it is to say, I want to, I want to follow what it is that God says in my life. It's this longing and desire to know and understand the word of God. Friends, do you have this longing? If I want to know more about God, I want to know his word more. But it's not done yet. That gave form. But then after the form came, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy once more. And he says in verse 9, Come, O breath, breathe into these dead bodies that they might live again. And listen, as they receive this breath, they stand and become an army. Revival happens when these dry bones breathe in the spirit of God and they begin to stand in power. In our New Testament, one of the most common ways the Holy Spirit is translated in the New Testament is pneuma, which means breath. It's like the breath of God. It's like the life-giving breath of God into our lives that is the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 through 19 says, don't be drunk with wine because you'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with that breath, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts, right? It's like it'll pour out from you. In Acts 1, 8, it says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Friends, if the church wants revival, it happens when we open ourselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit. When we invite the breath of God to come into us and pull us into who he wants us to be. Friends, this is not just like, God, help me today. Lord, be with me. God bless me. Not prayers like that. It's prayers like inviting the gifts of the Holy Spirit into your life. Of saying, God, without your spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control cannot exist inside of me. You must gift these to me and grow these in me. Wanting and desiring the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he says he gives gifts to each of us so that we might serve each other and that we might have power to go into the world. Praying over our days, praying over our circles, and actually waking up with this intent of going, God, I believe you have a purpose for my day today, that there's a reason why I'm here, that there's something you want me to bring into this world. Because friends, even as Christians, we can have this tendency to get so cold, just so comfortable in our faith that honestly, some of us can wake up in the morning and we have no plan but existing that day. Or sometimes we wake up in the morning and even though we're Jesus followers, let's be honest, some of you have had this experience, you've woken up in the morning and you've had this thought, I kind of wish I didn't. I kind of wish I was just home with the Lord and I didn't have to go through another day because you're in a tough season. But friends, in that moment, what we need is the spirit of God to make real in our minds. No, today I have a purpose. Today, I'm not just surviving today. I believe God wants to show me more of his spirit and he wants me to show his love to someone else. There's someone God's put in my path who I meant to show the love of God to, who I meant to try to draw close to Jesus and show them that God loves him and cares about them and pull them in. Friends, our world desperately needs an awakening. But if it's gonna happen, the only way it's gonna happen is if the church has a revival. Are we so content that we no longer desire more of God's word? Do you have this deep longing inside of you to know God more, to know his heart, to, to study the, the stories of Jesus so that when we walk through our day, we know how Jesus would respond because we know his heart? We can feel it inside of us. Do we have a desire for more of the Spirit of God, to hear his leading and feel his power, to see him draw us into our days in purpose? Friends, if we desire deeply the Word and the Spirit, then revival can begin in us right now. That's why I say revival right now, because that Spirit can begin to happen inside of you. In fact, 
Let's go back to the, to the exiles. Before Ezekiel ever spoke to those exiles, there was a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah gave the warning before it ever happened. He was telling them, listen, you've pushed the Lord out from you, right? You've grown cold. You're no longer in love with him. And there's going to be these serious repercussions to it. But even in that moment, before the exile happened, listen how Jeremiah points forward to the opportunity for revival. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14 says this. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God says, although you're going into exile, although this is this moment of remnant where the people of God are going to be very, very cold, he says, I already have a plan for revival for you on the other side of this. But what's it waiting for? Look at the next verse. In verse 12, he says this, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I'll gather you out of the nations where I sent you and I'll bring you home again to your own land. He says, I already have a plan for revival for you. And he says, you know what it's waiting on? It's waiting on the people of God to decide wholeheartedly that they want me once again. That they want my hand of blessing in their life. That they want my favor in their life. That they're not just content, just existing, but they desire me in their life. And he says, and when that happens... Revival will take place. Listen, I believe that God's desire is to spark revival in every corner of the church. God says over and over and over again in his word, he does not take joy in the destruction of the wicked that he wishes that all would be saved. But listen to me, revival will happen when we as his church are no longer content if it doesn't. Let me say that again. Revival will happen when we are no longer content if it doesn't. You see, that's what a cold church is. The cold and dead church is the church that looks around at the world around them, who is lost, so many who have no reference to them, and they just go, it's okay. The cold and dead church is the, the church that has grown, man, ineffective in their community, uninfluential in conversations of this country, and just goes, it's okay, it's okay. The cold and dead church is the one who just kind of does bare minimum. You know, we show up for a few minutes, and I, I whisper a prayer, and nothing really special happens, but it's okay. Friends, revival will happen when we are no longer content if it doesn't. When in our hearts we decide, I want more of God. I don't just want the bare minimum. I don't just want us to exist. I want to see God move mightily. Man, I am thankful for all that I have seen him done, but I am not yet satisfied. I desire to see more of God. I desire to know him more, to experience him more. And listen to me, this is how every revival is started. How every revival has started. No revival in history has ever begun because a big board of people got together and decided on it. No revival has ever started in history because a large church has decided we're going to start revival. We all agree it's time for revival. Revival starts when one person decides in their heart, I want more of God and this cold and dead faith is not what I desire. And then another comes along. And then another comes along. I guarantee you that's the story of Asbury. That one person lingered at the altar and then another saw that heart and said, me too. And then another saw that heart and said, me too. And then another saw that heart and said, me too. And that's how revival begins, right here in us, right now. John Wesley, who was behind so many of these movements, he said this in one of his sermons, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. 
He said, if one person just sets on fire in their faith, he says, people will start gathering around to be warmed by that spirit. But friends, church, are we just content? Are we, are we content just being close to God for an hour on Sunday? Or do we long to experience his presence daily? Are we content with the amount of understanding we have inside of his word? Or do we desire to pull his word into our life and begin to obey it, to truly know the things of God, to know his word and to become more like Jesus? Are we content just to exist in this world, just kind of we go to church and blend in? Or do we have this deep drawing that we need the Holy Spirit to empower us so that we might carry light into dark places, that we might speak truth and have strength and power despite what's going on? I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I love that story, that picture of the dry bones. It says it's not just that they came and they stood up and they were alive. It says they stood up and they became an army, became an army. Friends, that's the church. It's a group of people filled with the Spirit who doesn't just go off on their own, but we all link arms and say, we have the same mission. You're my comrade. You're my comrade. You're my comrade. And all of us are pushing in the same direction because it is our intent that more people in this world know the truth of who Jesus is, and we will help each other push forward that mission in our community, in our state, in our country. Friends, do you... Do you want more of God? Or are you just satisfied where you're at right now? Because listen to me, revival can start right now. And it starts in the heart of us who in this moment would say, I'm no longer content if it doesn't. I need revival to start right here. What I pray for happens nationally. I'm going to apply locally right here and right now. I'm not content if revival doesn't come into my heart. So what about you? I told you this. Listen, I can't preach you into revival. No pastor can. But in some of you in this moment, a longing has begun to form. And what I can do is I can do the same thing that Ezekiel did in that moment. I can prophesy over you and you can begin to move and God can begin to do work in you. And I would love to just invite you in this moment, would you do me a favor? Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads for one second? And I just literally want to say what Ezekiel said in that same moment, dry bones, Dry bones, hear and obey the word of the Lord. That right now in your hearts, you might feel this burning and this quickening. As I just say, dry bones, hear and obey the word of the Lord. That you would just have this pull, this vacuum inside of your chest of saying, I desire to know him more, to know his word more, to understand him more, to pull it into my life and become obedient. I'm not content with what I know so far. I need more of him. And I would prophesy again and I would say dry bones, dry bones, breathe in the spirit of God and stand up once again. Breathe in the spirit of God in this moment. Open up yourself and invite in the power and the breath of God into you and say, God, I can't live this life without you. I need your power. I need your purpose. I'm tired of just existing. I need your purpose to course through my veins, to turn me in to that army that I know I'm meant to be. For some of you today, you feel this pull inside of you. And it's because God wants to start revival in your heart right now. And listen to me. If it does, it will sweep from you to the people around you. It will sweep from you into the church. It will sweep from the church into the community, into our culture. And it will begin that awakening. Today is the day revival can start in your heart. That today you decide, this is the day I changed and I decided that the Bible was going to become this, this necessary thing for me to pull in my life. That prayer and seeking God's face was going to become this necessary thing that I'm not okay. I'm not content if revival doesn't come in. I need it in my heart. I need it in my life. And I want to seek God's faith with all that in my heart. Jesus, I pray right now. 
that for those who, who you are warming hearts, that you are warming spirits, I pray that they would just walk forward in courage. I pray, God, that some of us who have just been so content and so cold, right now you're just setting us ablaze, God. You're, you're knitting us back together and giving us new strength. You're, you're breathing your spirit into us and you're beginning that revival fire right here and now in our hearts. Jesus, this is all about you. It's all about you. And I pray, God, that you would draw us into being those, those alive and dependent soldiers that I know we're meant to be. God, revival or death? God, we need revival. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.